Welcome to the Lone Star Rhea Power Hour. This is uh, James Haney, one of your hosts, and I'm here alongside um, our other co-host, Mr. Ray Sasser. How are we doing? Now that I'm in the sun. That's good. You're spending a lot of time in the, in the sun lately. You know, Ron said uh, the less I do, the more I make. I think that's really true. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on, on trying that myself. <laughs> no, you're not. I'm trying to. <laughs> so anyway, uh, today's show is brought to you by one of our vendors, uh, Transact Title. Uh, and if you really need a title company, that uh, let me tell you, a title company is a one of the most important you know, pieces of your team that you can have, uh, you know, transacting, if there's a, a tricky title issue or something you'd have removed from title. Uh, I know Mansoor over there and all of his team, they have definitely bailed us out, uh, on quite a few deals. So transact title, uh, look them up, uh, for you being your title company on your next deal. Uh, so I just want to take a minute and go over some upcoming events that we have on Tuesday, November 8th, this coming Tuesday, uh, we have our Alma Maria meeting in San Antonio. Uh, and then on Saturday, we have the greater Houston. Did you say coming Tuesday? Yes, it is this coming Tuesday, November 8th. And then Saturday is Greater Houston RIA on November 12th. Uh, go to LoneStarRIA.net. That's LoneStarREIA.net. And you can get all the information there. Uh, we have a wonderful speaker coming in, Tom Zeeb. Uh, he's going to be talking about uh, traction. In fact, Google that book, Traction. Uh, we use it a lot for our, our staff meetings here at the RIAs. Uh, and it's very, very, uh, very powerful for running your business. Uh, and Tom Zeeb is, is very much a big fan of that. And so he does a lot of teaching and he also uh, talks a lot about wholesaling and negotiating and everything like that. So join us on November 8th, if you're in San Antonio and November 12th, if you are in Houston, you will not be disappointed unless you miss those meetings, then you will be disappointed. Now, we also, during those meetings, we do a lot of networking, and we have usually a tip of the month, and we'll have haves and wants where people have either that, that old washing machine they need for a rent house or that old rent house they need uh, a new buyer for. So, And then we also, uh, there will also be a case study, and we're also bringing back market updates uh, oh, yeah. to our, to our meetings. I got to go to work. <laughs> So, so, much for less, so you, less just, you, you just write out market update, Ray, and what that really means is, okay, Ray, you got to spend eight hours putting this stuff together, <laughs> figuring out what's going to happen in the market. Thanks, James. You're welcome. <laughs> but it shouldn't, uh, honestly, Ray, it shouldn't take you eight hours to do a market update. I know, I know there's a lot into it, but come on, Ray, you've been, you've been in the market. I'm exaggerating a little bit. <laughs> it still takes a lot of work. Yeah. You know, we got to see what's happening in the in the country. We got to see what's happening in the state. We got to see what's happening locally because all real estate's local. But now the elections are happening. I mean, this is like... It's a very, very volatile time that we're in. Interest rates are going up and up and up, and it's changing everything. I looked at a deal this morning where somebody said a deal had an 8% cap rate, and people used to stand in line for that. Now they're not standing in line for 8% cap, uh, eight, eight, a cap rate of 8 and that, that changes everything. So explain to a kindergartner what a cap rate is. A cap rate, the most... You can use it multiple ways, but the, the easiest way to understand it is it's what a passive investor would want to make on their investment. So in other words, a passive investor buys something with a cap rate of eight, then they're saying, I want to make 8% on my money on that investment. And that's my that's the cap rate I want. Now, different types of in, um, products have different cap rates, you know, like a class A apartment has a cap rate that's that's good. A class D apartment has a different cap rate. Many storages have cap rates. People don't typically use them on houses, uh, but even with houses, you've got to, at the end of the year, you need to look and see what your rate of return is on your investment, on your equity, and on 
uh, when we say investment, like how much you have in it. So now really quickly, because we're about to bring on our special guest, Ron Legrand is going to be joining us here shortly. Um, but back on just to kind of close out the cap rate conversation, uh, I was talking to our good friend, Tom Berry, um, probably a couple months ago. Uh, and you know, he just basically said that one of the ways that he explains it to people is, you know, that's your profit margin. If you're going to, you know, if you have an 8% cap rate, you know, and then you go and you borrow money and the money that you're borrowing, you're paying 10%. Well, that's, you're losing 2% money right there. Right. Um, and that's just the easy way. So if you're, if you have an 8% cap rate, but you're borrowing money at 5%, then you're getting a 3% return. So cap rate, that's a, that's a whole weekend class. <laughs> yeah, on, but it's that, important but. because investors are with inflation, our inflation is real high. But it's like you may not be able to match inflation with your investments, but what's worse is not doing anything because 1% that the bank pays versus 8 or 6 or 10 is better than better than nothing by far, a lot better. So as I mentioned, uh, Ron Legrand is going to be joining us here shortly. Uh, and just one kind of want to tell you, if you don't know who Ron Legrand is, you, you might've been living under a rock, um, but, uh, or you might be new to real estate. So, uh, Ron Legrand has been around, <laughs> Ron Legrand has been around. Thank you. I did that last part because all the newbies were saying, geez, I must have been under a rock. <laughs> Uh, so Ron Grant has been investing in, in real estate, gosh, even a little bit longer than you have. He's probably been I think he's 40, in 1980. Yeah. 40. Our first property was 82, but then we, it took us a year to do our first property. And then we didn't do another one for six or eight months because we were pretty beat up. <laughs> and, yeah. and, so, and uh, just, you know, Ron, Ron is always good to be around cause he's, he's got a, he's got some different, different takes on some different kinds of things. I know that there's people out there that go after the ugly properties, you know, Ron is more of the, the, you know, the pretty houses and, you know, he's all about creative real estate. Uh, and you know, he's a very, very good negotiator and he's all about, he's you know, he's, he's all about his terms deals. Yeah. Uh, yeah, terms is basically creative financing. And if you can get terms, then deals are much more sustainable. If you, When I started, interest rates were through the roof, and most people couldn't do normal deals. You couldn't go and borrow money from your bank and, and then turn around and make a good enough return. And you can't leverage your money when your cost of your money is higher than what you're making. So it's... It's difficult. Yeah. And, and honestly, it's perfect timing to bring Ron on because, you know, of where the market's going. We're going to talk to him a little bit about that uh, because both him and Ray have been through multiple market cycles. And, you know, we're seeing that we're moving into a, a different market. And the market is literally changing, you know, each month, you know, from what we're seeing. So joining us live now is. The one and only Ron Legrand. Welcome, Ron. How are you doing? I'm great, man. Sitting here in the most beautiful weather you've ever seen in your life in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, and uh, doing well. Well, good deal. Cause we're I'm actually sitting right next to Ray Sasser, and we're we're probably what a few hundred feet from the water ourselves. Yeah, we're but we're on the other side of the we're in the Gulf. I think he's in the uh, in the Pacific. I mean, Atlantic. Yeah, yeah. I am. And I think their water is bluer than ours. <laughs> I do <think it> <laughs> So, uh, so uh, first of all, thanks for joining us. Uh, yeah. Thanks for taking time out of your your busy schedule. I know you got lots going on, uh, but we definitely appreciate you joining us. So I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna let Ray ask you a couple of questions here, and we'll get right into it. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for. Uh, uh, being on the call with us, Ron, because I have the utmost respect for you. And it's just, uh, you've had a big influence on so many people and made so many million millionaires over the years, um, just getting into this real estate game. And now here we are, the real estate game looks like it's changing again. It seems like it never stops changing. Well, it doesn't, at least in my 40 years, it hasn't. But one thing I've learned is that the worse the market gets, the better it is for real estate investors. 
Yeah, it's just we got to play with new rules. And that's one of the things I'd like for you to talk about a little bit if you get a chance. Um, just what what are the rules? How are the rules changing from what we were doing three years ago uh, to, to what we should be getting ready to do now? Well, I got about half a voice, but I think I can probably address that. <laughs> uh, why don't we start with um, with Texas? Because I was recently advised uh, by uh, your closing attorney there in Dallas, Scott Horn, that you can, in fact, and should be doing lease options in Texas. And I've been advising against it for so many years. So um, I think your listeners probably need to know the rules. And now I'll give you my opinion on why I, I think smart investors are going to be doing just exactly that in the, in the coming months. Um, I know you guys are up on them, but you know that you can only collect a non-refundable option deposit for a six-month lease, and it better be canceled officially and in writing on that by that 159th day, or you're going to have a problem. <clears throat> because if you're not careful. They can come after you and get all the money back you gave them, or they gave you. However, that doesn't mean anything except they got six months to buy it and cash you out. Most of them will not do it anyway. It does not mean you have to give them the deposit back, and it does not mean that they have to move. So you can still leave them in the house, and uh, if you want to apply the deposit later, you can, but officially it's got to be terminated uh, on the 159th uh, day. So um, the problem with that uh, most texts have been doing uh, for a long time is they buy and sell with owner financing. But the problem is they're selling and they're killing all their uh, upside. Now they're going to get cash flow out of it. I get it, but we get the same thing with lease options, except we retain ownership and we get the appreciation. We just, and we get the depreciations, which is another thing you Texans aren't getting. So you got to wonder how many people that are in the wholesale business that don't do anything but that. How many how many of them do you think have looked back and asked themselves, what if I'd have kept about half of those houses? Especially in the last couple of years with this massive appreciation we've had that doesn't come along very often. I mean, are you guys well know this thing in the last couple of years has been uh, even better than uh, 2005 as far as price increases. Yeah, and we then, have. Yeah, then they went away and then they came back and they're gonna go away again. Uh, at what pace? I don't know and neither does anybody else, so. Uh, yeah. Our opinion is as good as anyone else's. They're all worthless. <laughs> hey, Ron, I just wanted to, I wanted to back up a minute. You said something that kind of threw me out. Okay. Yeah. The, you know, one of the things is when the lease option rules came out, we were doing lots of lease options. And now, it's like last year and the year before, the values went up 15 and 20% per year. And anybody that was selling, like you were saying, they were just throwing away all that appreciation. Yeah. Yep. Well, yeah, that's... Now around it's going the other way. So the, th the big message I think, Ray, is don't put yourself in a position to where you're on a short-term balloon and you have to sell. Because if you don't have to sell, that just means that you keep holding on until the market changes again. Because the good thing about a recession is it actually raises rents and it creates a bigger demand for rents. So investors are in a good position when the market changes as soon as the mindset of the uh, 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 you know of the of the people that want to sell houses catch up, and it is catching up pretty quickly, I think, and that makes them a lot more motivated. And of course, whether we sell with owner financing or lease option, we never have any problem putting tenant buyers or buyers in when they don't have to qualify at a bank, and that's our whole market. But you know, we got the biggest part of the market because most people who want a house cannot qualify for a house. And even that's going to get worse because the money's going to tighten back up again. So it's a good time to be a real estate investor. Yeah, and the, I like that because with the lease options, they don't need as much to get in. And then and then it's easier to fix than if they if they end up being an owner to an owner finance. Scenario. Well, that's not necessarily true because I get just as big lease option deposits as I do down payments. Oh, you do? Well, you need to share with us how you do that. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. And they're all non-refundable, which means if they buy, it gets credited toward their down payment. If they don't buy, they forfeit it. And I close everything with an attorney, as I suggest your folks do as well, uh, or you're going <laughs> are you going to learn a hard lesson. These things all got to be closed with an attorney. By the way, um, they recently passed a law in Texas that if you sell with owner financing to owner occupants, that you have to have an attorney. 
I think that's a great law uh, because I've been preaching it for so long. People get themselves in trouble trying to be their own attorneys. But the reason I get a big base option deposit is because I don't name the deposit and I don't name the monthly payment. I let the market tell me and I play the market and, you know, the highest bidder wins as long as they, uh, as long as I think they can make the payment and as long as they got enough money to satisfy me. And think about you know, when the market turns like this, think about what's going to happen when the, when the interest rates are so large that people can't afford houses, which they already are. There's going to be less and less people going to the bank to get a loan. But we're never, ever, ever, no matter what happens, the American dream of home ownership is so big in people's minds, they're going to do what they need to do to get in a house. But we make it so much easier for them. All they need is enough cash down to suit us. And frankly, that's as much as I can get. I shoot for 10% down on a lease purchase. Now, I'm assuming we got a nice house in a nice neighborhood. Okay, you guys out there in Texas and everywhere else have got low-end neighborhoods with uh, low-priced houses, and they are the hardest ones of the bunch to get uh, you know much money out of. Uh, that's how I grew up. I grew up in that same price ranges. But once you get past the median price, uh, you got a different class of buyer. And the higher price houses that we work on, the more money they know they need to begin with, so the less calls you get from broke people. But when you're down there in them low price houses, you know, most of them can't, can't even come up with a month's rent ahead of time. They're not my client. I'm, I'm looking for people that's got cash, and there's tons of them out there, and I don't ask them where it comes from. Um, but uh, so there's always a buyer with a ton of money who wants to buy a decent house because they can't qualify at the bank. Yeah, and the affordability is going through the roof with the higher interest rates. Yeah. So, well, that's interesting. So, like our median price, I'm going to just roughly say without looking it up, is say 270 in Houston. So you're you're like at the median price and higher on the lease options that you're going for. I'm lower than you. I'm only about 200. Yeah, but Houston's a lot, whole lot bigger than Jacksonville, Florida. And you got a whole bunch of areas in that city where you're meeting the way, way below median price. And so those are the ones I'm talking about. You know, the low income housing, not necessarily war zones, but most of your wholesale deals are done in that low income bracket and they're, and they're sold to renovators. So, you know, there's the low end and then there's a the medium and then there's the higher end. Um, I like the medium, which in your market is going to be somewhere between. Uh, 250 and 500,000, frankly. <clears throat> and you got a lot of houses in that in that uh, price range for the, for the terms business. For the ugly houses, it's going to be in the lower prices. Yeah, and you have a course on terms. And in that course, do you talk about lease options quite a bit? Of course. I can't yeah. have it on terms without telling them how to exit. You would be surprised, Ron, in our area, how often people say, and they say this about a lot of things, and they'll say, um, They'll say that lease options are illegal, and they're not illegal. It's like when they say subject twos are illegal. It's the, they just don't. I, but, but, Ray, there are always have been and always will be ignorant people in any group, and your job and my job is to try to train some of those that want to get trained, but we can't train the whole world. <laughs> When I go on the internet and see what some of these people are preaching and teaching, and you know, it makes me want to throw up. <laughs> if you're listening to this, you better be very careful to who you're listening out there. <laughs> Take advice from the people who have been there and done that, and not just some talking head on the internet. <laughs> well, early on, I listened to a guy named Jack Miller when he was talking about this, and he would just say, tell me chapter and verse, chapter and verse. If you're the expert, tell me the chapter and verse. Or is it saying it's illegal? Yeah. I say the same thing. I tell them, to go find me the statute. Because if there is no statute, it is not illegal. And the same thing with that subject, too. I don't know where that crap came from. Uh, between you and me, uh, I wouldn't have a heartburn if it was illegal. Because it's not doing the sellers any good when you buy a subject, too. And I preach against it nowadays. Uh, I'd rather buy with owner for dancing. Oh, yeah. Good. Seller's got a way to get the property back if you don't pay. And, you know, we're in the business of training people. But that doesn't mean that people actually listen to what we train, do they? <laughs> no. Go out there and make a mess. And, you know, the thing is, nobody is going to tell the seller that they can't take the house back. If, uh, I don't make the payments. 
nor they, they won't tell them if you want to go apply for another loan, you won't qualify because you got no income to offset your offset your debt that'll stay on your credit report. The fact that they don't have that discussion with a seller is, in my opinion, the reason that states are going to start outlawing subject to, but it wouldn't hurt my feelings if they did. They really wouldn't. You know, they probably do it like they do all the other laws. You got to have a license to do subject to, which doesn't mean anything. You said you go pass the test and get a license. <clears throat> look, uh, look at um, what they did in uh, Illinois and Oklahoma. They, they've outlawed assignment of contracts, unless, of course, they have a license. Right, right. And it's going to continue because people abuse the sellers. And a lot of these sellers become victims of these outrageous deals that these wholesalers are making. Yeah. So therefore, I mean, look, I'm not, I'm not opposed to a deal. Don't get me wrong. But when you are buying people's probably their largest asset and putting them in a position to where they got no recourse to come after you, and they know, and they ain't going to go qualify. It's going to kill their debt ratio. And they don't even tell them. And the attorneys don't tell them either. If they even, most of them don't even use an attorney. They close with a title company. Another mistake. But um, I don't, you know, I never did like that. I quit using subject to a lot. There's a couple of examples. For example, let's say I'm buying a house from uh, a couple of uh, kids that have inherited the house and loans in the parents' name. Well, I can't, I can't do the kids any harm by taking the loan subject to. Uh, same thing if uh, I'm buying a house from somebody and their credit is so screwed up and they're such a big mess, I know they're never going to apply for another loan. <laughs> if they don't care, I don't care. I'll buy a subject too. But uh, frankly, it's just as easy to buy it all wrap. In your case, a wrap around deed of trust. Right, right. And uh, in Florida, what, how fast does it take to foreclose on a property? Is it pretty fast like it is in Texas? Are you kidding? <laughs> Minimum six months. Oh, no, we're long. We're, we're 40, 40, uh, 51 days. It's 21 plus a 20-day notice. Yeah. Um, I thought they passed a law that they had to give them a longer notice, or was that just during COVID? Well, COVID, they, um, there were a lot of special rules going on. First, you couldn't even – yeah, you they, were, they weren't even doing the sales because uh, they couldn't uh, congregate publicly. So where they were, they were just shut those complete sales down. I'm working in the house right now, Ray, believe it or not. The seller moved out of it. They got a divorce. Both of them moved out. The house is vacant. They haven't made a payment since 2018 and, and it has not been foreclosed on yet. Wow. Can you imagine? <laughs> the HOA is foreclosing, but the, we can't even get a hold of the lender. We can't, we can't even get them to respond. So, you know, what's going on behind those scenes? I, I don't know. But I do know that uh, foreclosures are almost double what they were this time last year. Yeah. Right. And, well, we had a, we have a guy in our RIA who does, who uh, manages uh, foreclosure properties. And he said for two or three years, he wasn't getting any phone calls. And now everybody, all his old clients that were keeping them busy before uh, are calling them back and, and they're having them review properties for them and do comps for them and all kinds of things that, you know, that business was dead and now it's coming back. Yeah. Coming back fast. Now it'll get worse. You know, the, the more the inflation goes, the more the interest rates go, it's going to get worse. And people are going to start losing their houses because their income is not keeping up with their inflationary uh, needs in life. And, I mean, this thing is just making a mess. Personally, I don't see it much happening in the next couple of years, to be honest with you. I think it's just going to get worse for a while. And even if the Republicans win, I mean, what can they do? They've still got to have the president's signature to do much. So, Right. I'm going to be a little dumb here even if the Republicans do take over Congress. So you, one of the things we see all the time with people becoming new members of the RIA, Ron, is they they always say this, and it's like I cringe every time I hear it, and I'd like to get your feedback on it. They say, well, I'm just going to wholesale until I start making some money. Uh, <laughs> and they say, so give me your feedback on that. <laughs> it's almost funny. <laughs> Uh, uh, what are they making when they're wholesaling? <laughs> what, what are they, they taking? Marbles or crypto? <laughs> they're making money when they're wholesaling. They're just not getting the whole back end, uh, not getting all those goodies we get when we don't wholesale. 
appreciation, depreciation, debt pay down, which is a big one. And frankly, most of those tenant buyers default and many of the ones that buy with owner financing default, you can take the property back and do it again. Uh, you don't get any of that stuff. You just flip a house, whether it be wholesale or rehab. And rehabbing right now is a dangerous time to be rehabbing houses. Look, I rehabbed a thousand of them. And I got nothing against it, but it's the hardest way to make money and it has the most risk, especially if I go out there and go to a loan shark and obligate myself to a one year balloon. And then the, the prices start sliding and sliding. And next thing you know, all my profit is gone. And that's assuming I bought it right to begin with. Factor that in with all the slowdowns and getting the stuff and the prices, everything going up through the roof. I mean, uh, it's a it's a tough time to be in the business of rehabbing. So uh, I got nothing against wholesaling except that uh, all I get is a check and I have to give a big chunk of it to the IRS. And I don't know. I got to get up and keep on working or I don't keep on making money. Uh, that's, that's the difference between wholesaling and put yourself in a position to where the properties make you filthy, stinking rich. And you only got to do a job once and you keep getting paid. You know, we get more money, a lot more money, Ray, out of a non-refundable option deposit than they're going to get out of wholesaling the property. And we can look at Let's spend a little bit of time on that because you said a lot of stuff that for somebody that's starting out, I don't think they understand it. Like you said, they pay a stinking lot of money uh, when they wholesale, whereas they don't pay near as much money if they even lease option it for a year. And then and then turn around and sell it if that's what they want to do. So so how does like if you're newer in this game, how do you how do you navigate that? How do you get rolling and how do you make this work? And why is wholesaling bad compared to keeping okay. it? Wholesaling is not bad. It's just a way to get a quick check. And then uh, you're going to give the government the highest whatever tax bracket you're in, which is right now is 37 percent. But you can rest assured that's going up. Maybe <laughs> even then, uh, pretty soon you're giving away somewhere between 25 and 37 percent of that money to the IRS. But you know what? These these investors don't think like that. You know, they go spend the money, and the next thing you know, they get a great big old tax bill, and the IRS is all over them. Uh, especially when they got all these new agents now to pursue them. So you got to take care of Big Brother and Washington because they're not going to forget you, and it's just too easy to spend that money. Like you said, though, when I put a tenant buyer in a house. Uh, I haven't sold the house, therefore I have no tax consequences whatsoever. And if I do hold it at least a year, I get to uh, do uh, long-term capital gains, which right now is 15 or 20 percent, depending on how much you're making. So, but even then, I got three different ways to do it: never pay taxes when I sell. So, uh, uh, and that will not work with wholesaling or rehabbing, either one. Uh, so, uh, well, there is there is one method we can use. Uh, it's a solo 401k to where you can actually rehab and uh, borrow money, and it doesn't trigger unrelated business income tax like the Roth IRA does. But uh, but I have a, a method where I trade one house into three houses as long as I buy them with our financing. I'm not going to get into that right now because I need to illustrate it. But anyway, it's not that hard to never pay taxes when you're selling a house and cashing out of it. But as long as you're keeping it, you don't have to worry about that anyway. Right. Right. And, you know, I figured I did like the present value of an income stream on, on a rental property. And, and with my math, I figured that a buy and hold guy makes a minimum of seven times more than a wholesaler does. I, I'd say at least. Yeah. So the key is how do you, how do you make, how do you eat while you're holding on to property? Well, again, I get I get a bigger check up front than they do when they also. Because you're doing the lease option. Right there. Right there, I'm ahead. Okay. And you just eliminated the need for being a wholesaler. Correct. And the next thing is I get that monthly cash flow every single month, which is called residual income. You don't have to get up and work for it. And by the way, I get big deposits. They're non-refundable, Ray. Plus, I make them responsible for all the repairs, period, after the first 30 days. So I don't have any problem with my tenant buyers. I had a lot of problems when I had tenants, and I had hundreds of them. I don't want any more of them. Okay. <laughs> tenant buyers are a different breed of human. First of all, they got a dog in the hunt. they got thousands of dollars at risk. If they don't pay the rent, they're going to lose that option deposit. And um, we make that very clear, signed off one in blood, one of an attorney. So 
Uh, it's a legal binding contract. So they're not, if, and I don't mean they don't move because most of them do. Live there a couple of years, just decide they want to move for what a you know, whole list of reasons, which I don't care. Because now I can just go out and lease option the same house again and collect another big non-refundable deposit. And then the whole time my debt is getting paid down by someone else in the house. And I get to appreciate it uh, every year if it appreciates. And I get to depreciate it regardless of whether I get to appreciate it or not. And I get the debt pay down. But that big monthly cash flow can very soon put me out of a job. Okay, there is no such thing with wholesaling and rehabbing. Yeah, this is such a, it sounds like such a simple solution. It is. It just means that I either buy on terms, which is my big deal right now, which is which, which I've been doing through the hottest of the hot markets, or I fund an all-cash deal with a private loan that I get from a human being, not a loan shark, on the longer term. Uh, at a reasonable rate right now, 7% is a very, that's what I've been paying private lenders forever. Right now, that's what the banks will charge you. So uh, you, you, you can fund the deal. It's got to be a, it don't even have to be a lower price house. If you understand the, the art of creating the financing, for example, let's say I'm paying 7% interest, but the outgo on that loan is more than the rent will allow and I don't have any positive cash flow. Well, that's easy. I just change the terms to the person that's lending me the money. You know, I, I pay them 7%, but I'll pay them maybe 3% now and the rest of it on the back end when I cash out for crying out loud. In other words, I structure the deal to match the terms. And uh, I can do that with any private lender. If I'm getting money from my from people, that nor, normal people, not loan sharks, who want to give me a one-year balloon and charge me five points and all that crap, uh, I'm, you know, for years, that's where I borrowed money until I learned I don't need to do that. I can ask other people for money just as easy as they can, and I make the rules. So right. when we exactly. borrow money today, we make the rules. Uh, they don't make the rules. And if they want to, and besides, when somebody lends money, and, uh, and new, newbies have a hard time getting this through their head. They think, well, this, lend, funny, this person lends me money, they're going to want it back real quick. No, that's not true. Okay. <laughs> true for loan sharks that are making points every time they turn the money. That's not true for private lenders. If they wanted it back so quick, they wouldn't lend it to you to begin with. No, it's just the opposite. Yeah. They, they don't want the hassle. Yeah. And even when they do get paid off, they say, what are you going to do with my money? And you can get it out there again. <laughs> yeah. We just did a modification actually this morning where the people want to keep the money out longer because they don't have better options. Well, who could blame them? Yeah. It's a yeah. Crazy Something you said about, about changing the interest rate or at least the payments on a lender, uh, I wasn't clear if you were doing that with a seller also. In other words, if you had to do No, this is the case. Well, I could do it with a seller for sure, but I'm going to get a lower to 7% rate with a seller to begin with. Always. Right. But right. let's say I'm funding a cash deal with a private loan. Okay. I might even fund, it might, it might even need rehab, right? So I borrow enough to buy it and rehab it. Rehab it to the point to where I'm putting a tenant buyer in it now not rehabbing it to the point to where I'm selling it for cash, which is probably going to save at least 30% of the rehab cost. Uh, and uh, in other words, I borrow more than I need as long as the loan to value ratio was there. But now let's say, I don't know, let's say it's a $400,000 house. And if I have to borrow 70% on that, that's a $280,000 loan. I don't know what that is per year, but if I, if I pay a private lender, I'm probably going to have to pay about 7%. So what is that? That's about, uh, I don't know, $20,000 a year, give or take. Yeah, about. Okay. All right. Uh, but let's, so let's just say that the cash flow would support that. I mean, not, look, I know the cash flow would support that loan payment, but I want plenty left over, right? I'm not going to put myself in a position to where I'm, where I'm putting out almost as much as I'm bringing in. That's a recipe for disaster because things happen, all right? Uh, such as tenant moves out and takes me a month to put another one there. Right. Or tenant moves out and I got to go do some work on it. Uh, you know, I better have some positive cash flow there. So what I'll do is I'll create more cash flow by telling the lender, uh, I'm going to give you, say, 4% on a payment, and I'll give you the other 3% when I cash out of the house. 
so to the crew every year. So, but so, but my debt will go down every year and my value should go up every year and I'm getting tons of cash flow out of it. So my debt to the lender will increase but my cash flow will increase with it as well. So I'll just structure it to the, and by the way, when I'm dealing with a private person, they don't know what private lending means till you tell them that's not their business. That's just a way for them to make a nice return safely. So I'll, I'll say the cash flow increases and our rent goes up like it has this last year. You know, I'd call them and say, you know, I can pay you more per month now. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I can, we can change the rules anytime we want to change them when I'm dealing with a human being. But all the private loans I've done, I've never done that. You've taught me something today. I appreciate it. Because cash flow is important. You know, you have to be able to eat and you have to be able to get things working. And, and so you, you can't kill the get We're the machine that makes this work for the lenders and they, they can't choke us to death in the process. Yeah. You know, for example, you can say, well, I can give you 5% monthly, and then I'll give you another 5% of the profit on the back end, uh, or whatever it is, 7%. Who cares? Who cares? Uh, so now they're getting a higher rate of return, but they're getting part now and part later. Yeah, I love it. I love it. The- every, every year that goes by, that, 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 that money that you owe them gets larger and larger and larger. So somewhere along the line, you have to keep track of it because you may want to just cut them a check when the next time you put a tenant buyer in there, for example, gets the private lender up if you want to, you know, use common sense. You know, Ron, another thing is you're talking and, and we're kind of talking about this, but we went from a market where uh, all the person had to do is say they wanted to sell their house and they had people standing in line. It was hard to work with people like that, but now we're going into a market where they're going to start they're going to start calling us back and they're going to start wanting us to make it some sort of deal to stop their problem. And what a great time to really yeah. learn and be good at seller financing. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I said, as soon as the mindset of the market catches up to the market, as there's still a lot of them out there that think that people are going to line up around the block to buy your house. And, and in some cases that may be true, Ray, by the way, when you hear that story, it's because the house is listed. Yeah, yeah. Also, aren't, don't have that working for them. They don't have a list of buyers, and most of them don't know how to sell a house. You know what? I got a whole floor of virtual assistants who call sellers for our students. We can't get more than 50% of the people to pick up the phone after three tries. Why would I put my house on the market online, put a phone number in it, and not pick up the phone? <laughs> that, that's who we're dealing with. That's the mindset we're dealing with. Half of them don't even know the facts about the house. <clears throat> Half of them, geez, you have to do a seminar for them and, and, and to get them to understand anything. <laughs> well, the, the, the most people who are trying to sell their houses just simply aren't qualified to sell it, which means they don't sit there. Of course, there's a lot of other reasons. Maybe they don't want to show it. Maybe it stinks. Maybe they're a hoarder. Maybe they get stuff piled up high. Maybe they just don't want to take calls from people, uh, especially with all the morons. Uh, so replying by, on the internet, they go try to sell something on the internet today and see what happens. I mean, well, and you get we're my phone's ringing off the hook with with uh, cold callers right now, just saying, "Hey, we yeah. want to buy your property," blah blah blah. And it's like, yeah. you know, so the 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 people picking up the phone are pretty wore out anyway. But the other thing is what I'm seeing is that a lot of people don't know how to sell their house or they're hoarders or they're ashamed of their house, but they've got a problem They They have to pay, you know, Texas and Florida, you got to pay property taxes every year, which is a lot of money. So your equity just goes away every year. So the, um, uh, there's a, there's always a force against the seller to sell that property. And when the market stops buying, like they are, buying, like they have been, yeah. and that's the opportunity for us. The more people are afraid of what's coming, the easier they are to get to sell their houses. Yeah. Rich people run toward the chaos, not away from it. Right. Wealth, wealth comes from chaos. That's true. Yeah, so, I remember the story you were telling me that one time when you see, see uh, what was it? It was either a rat or a ship or something. They were going this way, and that's the time to go. That way. <laughs> well, the rats are running off the ship. It's time yeah. to head towards the ship. Yeah. <laughs> Good. 
I don't know about that. But, uh, well, Ron, it's been great. And by the way, uh, how do people get a hold of you and get that course? And we didn't, we weren't trying to pitch that, but it just seems so appropriate now that you've got that, you've had that course out for a little bit. And I'm well, sure you keep it updated. Let me give you a link so they know, we know it came through you. There's a couple of things, actually. They can go to ronlegrand.com forward slash Ray. That's L-E-G-R-A-N-D, not L-A, and there's no E on the end. RonLegrand.com forward slash Ray, and they can get a five-hour seminar of me going through the terms of business completely, along with the last hour being discussing actual deals that we generated while the seminar was going on. And, and that's free, and I don't know when it's uh, airing, but they, when they go there, they'll find out. And if they uh, want to learn about the terms business, probably the easiest thing to do is go to ronlegrand.com forward slash terms, and there's where they uh, can watch an hour and 15-minute uh, webinar on uh, on terms, how you know, step-by-step, and also get my terms course at about $300 off. <clears throat> and, of course, ronlegrand.com is a massive site. They'll, they'll get them anywhere they want to go. Ron, I want to thank you for being on the call. And I, just for the people listening, I, I got the opportunity to sit about once a quarter with Ron in a mastermind session. And it was such a pleasure to be around you because you, the main thing you did is you opened my eyes and my ears to all the possibilities that are out there. And it's just, you just got to show up and be around the people doing what you want to do. And, and and success is automatic. And so that's why we still do live events with humans in a room. <laughs> I, I do, you know, I do virtuals, but trust me, live ones are a whole lot better for a lot of reasons. And I have to, I have to make myself sit in front of that uh, that camera. <laughs> but I, but I do it, I do it, and, and uh, I, everything has changed since COVID hit. So we have to change with it. And it's yeah. a done. The market is always going to change. And the people that are making money and the people who got wealthy simply changed with it. Like we just discussed. Hell, we're not, you know, sometimes even the rules change, which we better keep abreast of that. But people always need to sell. Other people always need to buy. That is not going to change no matter what happens in the economy. When I started in 1982, the prime rate was 16.8%. And just for the record, for all you young listeners, Yes, it can get worse. Hey, <laughs> you'll live long enough. You'll see. Yeah, Carter called that the misery index. <laughs> um, I, was I was there standing in line for gas. <laughs> <laughs> On the road. I, don't, I don't remember that. I was just walking during that time. <laughs> I remember because I was just starting. Yeah. And I, I didn't have a clue what was going on. I just figured out how to do one thing. We'd buy a house, fix it, and sell the note. Me buy too. the house, fix it, and sell the note. Well, when I started, we'd buy the house and fix it and let somebody assume it because they didn't have to qualify. Yeah. You know, I mean, well, actually, I had a partner to go get an FHA loan, and then somebody would assume it and get that loan away off his back. And we, we did that 23 times, man. Then they changed the law on us. Of course, uh, you know I always like to make a I always like to make a reference to an old country song because I'm I'm a country music fan. But there's an old song that says the only thing that stays the same is everything changes. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, I'm a country fan yeah. too. Probably ought to listen to some of them country songs. They got some pretty cool words in them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, well, Ron, this is James again. I just, you know, I appreciate you, you know, taking time out of your busy schedule. Like I said, uh, you're down in Houston and Aria back in July. That was, that was fun. Uh, and then some of us went, you know, and saw you in person again. It's always a pleasure to be around you and always, you know, trying to pick up and learn something from you. You know, I think today's conversation was actually a really good one. Yeah. You know, we, we did get down in the weeds, but it was lots of valuable content. So. I appreciate everything you do for us. I'm going to be in Dallas next year in March, uh, 21 through 24, on, for my live boot camp. Um, by the way, can I tell them about my podcast? Uh, uh, Absolutely. Uh, 
called TheMentorPodcast.com, and I interview a lot of smart people like Ray and James here. TheMentorPodcast.com. There's a, I mean, there's some really good content. I just interviewed a guy that is new to air any time now. They'll show you how you can cost segregate single-family houses, which I never knew in my entire life. And he'll show you about, he'll show you about it. Uh, appreciation. Now, about 25% of your purchase price of your house can be written off over a five to seven year period. And most people don't even know that. To me. So, I mean, maybe they do it on apartments and stuff, but they're, you're saying that he does it on houses also. Yeah, well, I've had it done on commercial properties, but I didn't know you could do it on houses. Now, you can't live in the house. So, anything, rental house, you've got a bunch of rental houses sitting out there. You better get a con, uh, hold of, the, of this guy. Um, and um, that's assuming, i tell you what, his name is Joe Vyrie, V-I-E-R-Y. And he's in cost segregation, can't be hard to find. Uh, and he'll educate you because uh, he did me. And it, uh, it, that's, it costs a few dollars for, and he does it, most of it without even visiting the house because it has to have a special form to present to your CPA to pass IRS scrutiny. And I'm telling you, who knows, who knows about that? That's, that's what we get out of doing podcasts, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. We interview people like that. So I've interviewed a lot of really quality folks, the mentor And I'm talking too much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thanks again, Ron. And, and we look forward to seeing you very soon again in the future. You too, guys. Always a pleasure. Bye. Bye. All right, so that is going to do it for today's show. Anything that we talked about or referenced today, you can find it at LoneStarRia.net. That's LoneStarREIA.net. Uh, and we'll have that uh, link to the Ron LeGrand sub up. That's, that'll be up there uh, shortly. Um, but again, anything that we referenced is on the LoneStarRia.net website. And this will be a weekly show, so we look forward to seeing you next week.